Hello, good morning. Welcome to Joy News, to the, uh, Joy News Desk. <laughs> My apologies. Coming up this morning, despite the numerous assurances from relevant authorities to intervene in the treatment of kidney patients after Joy News Dialysis Crisis Thought Leadership event, the outpatient department of the renal unit remains closed. The death toll has risen from 14 patients of our last press conference to 19 patients. We'll hear from frustrated patients who say the death toll continues to rise. Also, Parliament to consider a new instrument which will create a new constituency for the South areas to rectify the constitutional anomaly that has left thousands of residents in that area without representation in Parliament. This is the instrument that is likely to save this house and forgive us for the cardinal sin that we are said to have committed. And as the NPP prepares to elect a new leader on November 4, Vice President Dr. Mama Dubaumia is fighting off claims he mismanaged the economy more as his contenders accuse a party of rescue in favor of the Vice President. My name is Aisha Ryan. Do stay for details. Despite assurances from relevant authorities to intervene in the treatment of kidney patients following Joy News' dialysis crisis thought leadership event, the outpatient department of the Colibri Renal Unit remains closed. We'll hear from the Kidney Patients Association shortly, but first, here is CEO of the hospital, Dr. Pukuwari Ampoma, explaining the closure. Uh, we've been under recovering for some time now. As I said, our prices were set about three years ago. So this, uh, if I, and you should also appreciate where we've come from. When dialysis started in Kolibu, the average cost per session was around about $100 per session, equivalent of $100. And now the price has come down considerably. As of today, we're, 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 but the current, we're under recovering for the current uh, price. And so we also need to, much as we, sympathize the patients, we also need to keep the service sustainable. And so First Sky support has been very, very tremendous in helping us to be able to provide service for about 80%, free that is for 80% of the patients that we treat. Unfortunately, because of the increase in the cost of the consumables, not the increase in the cost as such, because in, the, in, uh, in Forex it's the same, but uh, when it comes to the CD equivalent, it's gone up. So we need to uh, you know, make the, those adjustments. And so that is a uh, situation. In fact, as we stand now, the renal unit has a deficit or has a financial deficit of 4 million cities that we need to, uh, you know, that we are trying to find ways of... Is, is that debt? Yes, that's Or you debt. owe a supplier? No, it's debt. Yes, debt. Debt that we owe. How do you accrue that? Uh, How was that accrued? It's because of, of the under-recovery from the, from the service that we are providing. And so to continue to run at full throttle uh, would mean that with this debt is going to balloon, okay? And that is why there was a need for us to look at adjusting the, uh, the, the, you know, the price whilst we also engage with the next relevant stakeholders to see how best this deficit can be met. Presidential Advice on Health, Dr. Antonin Siasari, gave the assurance that the government will intervene in the situation to get the unit open. But to date, the unit remains closed to outpatients. Spokesperson for the Kidney Patients Association, Daniel Hammond, says the situation is causing the death toll to rise.
We can now speak with President of the Renal uh, Patients Association, Abafo Kojo Ahenkra, who joins us on the line for more. I'm grateful for your time, sir. Uh, has there been any improvement with regards to access to dialysis treatment at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital since the last time we spoke? Uh, um, no, uh, so uh, the, the, the unit is still not open to the outpatient. But my understanding is that the kind of consumables that they have, if the unit is to open to the OPD um, and something is not done about it, they, they, they will run short within a month. Uh, so that, and if, if that happens, if there's any emergency cases, and I mean, they cannot handle it. So that is why they are doing, um, they are still using it to do the, um, the inpatient and then the emergency cases. But so that outpatients, we don't have access to the place. We are hearing that, I mean, since that time until date, there's been more deaths. Uh, can you confirm this? Yes, yes. Um, after the time we did the first press, it was 14. Now we are up to 19 now. We have five more additional to rate. So 19, we have 19 um, people. We've lost 19 people, yeah. So how are your... Um, Members coping. <laughs> My dear, we we, how, we are not coping with it. We are just there. The point is, we cannot even um, um, access the, uh, the private dialysis centers because it's very expensive. Secondly, I, I always keep saying this thing: we cannot. The kind of treatment Kolibu gives to to us is the best, and some of the the private dialysis centers are not. I wouldn't say it's not the best, but the kind of quality Kolibu gives is quite different from what they give. So it's like the system is used to Kolibu, and now you go out and you're not getting the kind of the, the treatment, uh, the clearance that you need. So it's, uh, we are not coping. It's like we are just managing the situation. You get the money, you go and find a place and you do one. Now most of them too are not able to do the two or three times sessions a week. They are just managing one, and which is another big blow. Which is another big blow. So we are day in, day out, most of the outpatients now are now going back to the ward because they are feeling sick. And they go for checkup clinic, then you'll be admitted, and they go back to the ward. So the situation is getting worse, worse, and worse. Now, the Kolebu says that it's being swallowed by its four million debt, and and that's, I mean, the reason why this is happening. What exactly do you want from government? Oh, I'm I'm very happy you raised this issue. In fact, I've been on other platform with the Kolebu CEO. Talking about this uh, four million issue, and the last time when we were at your studio, the um, um, presidential advisor, Dr. Chan, made an assurance that they are going to see to it that that four million will be paid. And my dear, honestly speaking, <laughs> I mean, that money needs to be paid because they owe Trisino, the people who give us the government, they owe them. And once that money is paid, maybe something can be done. The last time I had a check with the Columbia studio, they were saying that if they are going to charge the 380, the old price, then there's supposed to be a subsidy from the government, about nine and something um, um, per month. You know, and all this boils down back to this. The government has to come in. This thing, there are other countries, they are doing it for free. They are doing it for free. And I keep saying now, kidney issue, it's not about in uh, old days, they would say that people who drink, people who smoke. But now come to Kolebu, we have nine years, 10 years, 13 years. They, have they, they taken any alcohol? Have they got any smoke? It's a disease now, and it's, not, it's global. People are getting it. And the, nobody can sustain it. No one can sustain it. So government has to come in. And then we are begging the government, the taxes on the, yeah, the, 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 the consumables, the taxes on the consumables. Because now if the government says you're going to do something on Kolibu, all the pressure will be on Kolibu. Everybody will come to Kolibu. But if the taxes are taken off, the private centers still can have a very moderate prices for them so that we can go into it. And the Kolebu have to check the prices that are that they are doing the right thing to. This is the, the, the appeal we are giving to the government. As they look at the taxes, and then that $4 million the tax is, uh, the Kolebu is going to Zeno, they should see to it for us. Because, my dear, and this thing that we are talking about is going to take them about between 6 to 12 months, what the poor boy said. Oh, you close this thing from me, and now we should wait for another year before you can put this thing on NI. Then before then, all of us will die. Yes, definitely. And I, I, it's, it's really a pathetic uh, story, but we, we are still pushing this and we are hoping that this will be resolved 
shortly. Definitely, we had the uh, presidential advice on health, uh, assuring that this will happen. The National Insurance Authority has also promised that it will feature on the National Health Insurance Scheme. And so we will see how this goes and that uh, the situation will be solved. I'm grateful for your time. Uh, he's a president of the Renal Dialysis Patients Association and he's lamenting that Kolebu must uh, get its uh, renal units opened so that uh, they can also have access to the machines. Let's get on to other stories. Speaker of Parliament Alban Bagwin has ordered a parliamentary probe into the Akosombo Dam spillage that has left thousands of residents in at least seven regions displaced and properties running into millions of cities destroyed. A section of the public have criticized the Volta River Authority, which undertook the spillage for not sensitizing the affected communities enough. Parliamentary Affairs Correspondent Kuku Asante reports. Parliament had been on recess all this period whilst several communities had been taken over by the floods caused by the spillage of the Akosumbo Dam. Whilst the human suffering in these communities continue, Parliament is now set to take some action on their behalf. Minority leader Dr. Kisela Tufosen in his welcome remarks announced his side was going to file a private member's motion to demand a probe. In the last few weeks, Mr. Speaker, we have witnessed arguably the biggest man-made disaster to ever befall our nation. I am referring to the devastation caused by the spillage of the Akotombo Dam by the Volta River Authority. Mr. Speaker, as minority caucus, our hearts bleed for all the victims of this man-made disaster, which has rendered several thousands of people homeless and swept away farms, destroyed livelihood of many people in parts of OT region, Volta region, Eastern region, Greater Accra region, Bono East, Savannah, and Northern regions. Mr. Speaker, the affected communities and regions have yet to recover from the aftermath of this disaster. The conduct of both the government and the Volta River Authority in terms of leading a coordinated emergency response and disaster relief effort leaves much to be desired. Right Honorable Speaker, I conclude by saying that we hereby serve notice that we will present a motion to demand a parliamentary inquiry into the circumstances that led to a man-made disaster of such magnitude. The majority leader of Seichi Mensa Bunsu focused on the politicization of the floods but insisted the VRA must be brought before MPs to answer questions. The House may have to invite the VRA to brief us on the situation relating to the spillage and all other connected matters. The Speaker, I believe the Minister um, responsible for water resources and indeed energy as well. It is scary, Mr. Speaker. There's 10 some Ghanaians, including some MPs, go to politicize every single event in this country. As MPs, one of our core responsibilities is to inform and by that educate the citizenry. Speaker of Parliament Alban Bagwin has now ordered that the House conducts an inquiry into the flats and the VRE's actions. It is unacceptable that an activity as potentially destructive as dam spillage was done without a well thought through security and safety preparedness plan. As such, Parliament will take the necessary action to inquire into the matter and make recommendations for the protection of property and lives living along the Volta River and Lake and other settlements along river beds. Honorable members, this is a national assignment, and Parliament should be seen to be leading in finding solutions to this somehow perennial problem confronting the nation. It is not clear which form exactly this probe that has been ordered by the Speaker will take, but it will normally come in two forms. Either a special committee will be constituted with members from 
either side of the house to look into these matters or an existing standing committee will be asked to look into these matters. But of course, it must be put on record that the NDC MPs have had some strong words for the Volta River Authority, which they say have spearheaded this man-made disaster in the Volta region. But one thing that has stood out in this matter on the floor of the House is that both sides have spoken about the need for government and other individuals to move in to restore life to normalcy. Reporting for Joy News, Riku Asante, Parliament House, Accra. Let's stick with Parliament because the House has been asked to consider a new instrument which creates a new constituency for the South areas. The constituency which will be known as a Guan constituency is to rectify the constitutional anomaly that has left thousands of residents in the area without representation in Parliament. The EC's action in not allowing residents in South to vote in the parliamentary election in 2020 has been roundly condemned. The new instrument has been laid and has been referred to the subsidiary legislation committee by the speaker. Honourable members, the representation of the people parliamentary constituencies amendment instrument 2023 is referred to the committee on subsidiary legislation for consideration and report to the house. This is the instrument that is likely to save this house and forgive us for the cardinal sin that we are said to have committed. It deals with the, the issue of the SAP. And um, a number of them have now come up for consideration by the house. Now, the youth of Garu, uh, Garu and Timpani in the Upper East region are demanding an unqualified apology from the Ministry of National Security and the Ghana Armed Forces for the brutality meted out to civilians in the two districts at dawn on Sunday. At a joint press conference in Garu, the youth also demanded a full-scale investigation into the incident. According to them, some personal belongings of some of the civilians were taken away from them and must be returned. Emmanuel Isaka spoke on behalf of the youth. These unprofessional military men claim that some of the some some alleged four national security operatives who were in Garu on an official assignment bare faced falsehood peddled by the Ministry of National Security. Ladies and gentlemen, permit us to set the record straight on some falsehood and half-truth peddled by the Ministry of National Security in their 29th October press release. One, the Ministry of National Security claimed that the Arab youth attacked the vehicle when the officers were seated in the Land Cruiser vehicle with registration number GS 7520-22, which was removed and kept aside the vehicle. This is not accurate. The record should reflect that the officers were not in the vehicle, but rather inside the police station at the time the unknown assailants fired gunshots into the vehicle. The claim by the, NASA, the Minister of National Security that the officers shot refuge at the police, the Garu police station, is woefully, is, is wholly inaccurate and yet another attempt to create disaffection for the people of Garu and Tipani. It, it was rather the Vigilant youth who requested that the claim officers go with them from the, their hideout to the police station to authenticate their identity. If the Minister of National Security claimed that their barbaric act and unprofessional conduct was to retrieve the weapons, 
used in attacking the vehicle. At least the DCEs were present at the time of the torture. We asked, where are the seized weapons? Yes, there are no single reported incident of the retrieval of weapons from any of the homes invaded. We asked, did the Minister of National Security and the military invade and visit such heinous crimes on the people of Wadewale when a VIP bus that loaded passengers from Kumasi was burned into ashes no. at the Wadewale police station? No! no. Why the people of Garu and Timpani? Oh, start. Okay. On Tuesday, background to the issue. Some of the youth of Garu and Timpani have also been expressing their frustrations and making some demands of government. We're going to take the laws into our hands, but we will not come out as workers in the town whilst we are being beaten whilst our items are taken from us, whilst our leaders are still in police custody, and we don't even know where they are whereabouts. for us. The whole of Ghana, if it is really true that those boys they have arrested and airlifted them to Accra are really militants, as the whole country is speculating, the cause of our land yes. will speak for us. Yes. Yes. With the arms, the whole country is penalized about the people of Garu, the good people of Garu, that we have taken two arms. If it is true, the cause of our land in this country, not Garu alone, the whole of the cause of the land of the whole of Ghana will speak for us. Upper East Region correspondent Albert Sorry, who's been following this for us, joins us with more. Albert, what's the latest uh, on this story? Well, so there hasn't been um, any major update this morning. Uh, one of the major issues for the people of Garou is for um, government to take action uh, to conduct an investigation into the incident and also for those who have been arrested, their families are saying that most of them, or if not all of them, um, were not involved in the attack on the national security personnel, and so they want them released. The regional minister was in the area two days ago, and he gave the assurance that once the investigations and uh, whatever reasons they were arrested for are concluded, uh, they will be released and be made to come home. And so these are the things that the people of uh, Garu are waiting for. But then there are also the concerns of um, you know, some of them not being able to provide uh, the, the cost of medical care for uh, their families. Remember, this is a very rural area, and uh, a lot of the people are poor. And some of them feel that you know they were not planning to go to the hospital. They were not sick. They, uh, soldiers just came into their homes, bashed in, and beat people up, left them with injuries, and, you know, a lot of them were not even arrested or charged for any crime. And so they are, they are expecting that this issue should not be swept under the carpet, and government should really uh, do something about it, take care of the cost of medical bills. The regional minister pledged an amount of 10,000 Ghana cities to support the victims, but a lot of them feel that this will not be enough because um, there's a patient who, at the moment, has been transferred to the Tamale Teaching Hospital because of a chest and head injury. Another one was transferred to a neighboring hospital in Garou. And so they feel that government needs to do more and also to, uh, you know, render an unqualified apology to the people of the area for the actions of the military. 
Alves, sorry, is our correspondent uh, in the Upper East region. We'll definitely bring you more from that side on the story. Now, flag bearer aspirant of the governing New Patriotic Party, Dr. Uze Friakoto, says he's capable of breaking the eight for the NPP in the 2024 elections. Over 200,000 delegates of the NPP will on Saturday elect the party's presidential candidate for the next elections. He's, however, warning any attempt to subvert the will of the people will be disastrous for the party. Alton Broby reports. Out of 958 delegates, Dr. Ousu Afiya Koto pulled 36 votes in the Super Delegates Conference in August, enough to secure him a seat among the table of five. According to him, he went into the election hoping to make the first five. So our strategy was to make sure that we are in the five. And we, we are in the five. And this coming forth is a totally different ballgame altogether because we are talking about 20 times the number yes so how yes. do you respond to those who say that this clearly is a reflection of what is to come oh well i think they have, they have been it's a misjudgment but why do you think that it can change because the delegates down there are totally different from their leadership the, their leadership have disappointed them i'm very confident that those down there who have worked suffered so much for this party will take the right decision and that right decision is to choose also a free akuto as their flag bearer. But after engaging more than half of the 900 super delegates, he was shocked that only 36 voted for him. I fear the delegates, yes, and that's true. Mm. But the thing is that for me, according to out of the 958 who voted, at least I can say that I spoke to directly to more than half of them to convince, to, to, go, to sell my vision for the party and for the country. And I was very sure that at the end of it, they, they bought into my vision. Mm. At the end of the day, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. So, <laughs> who's a fear was right that you fear delegates. But in the case of the 220,000 delegates, I don't think I've, I've, I've been, been tried with even 10% of them. Mm. Except that you rely on the structures that you build to get your message to, to them. But the insincerity of the delegates is not his only concern. The former food and agriculture minister tells me the entire process was skewed in favor of one candidate. The reasons given by Mr. Tremartin for quitting the contest to start with before coming out to say that he's no longer with the party, uh, those are very solid ones and I'm very sympathetic to those. See, the implication of all this is the unity of this party. Mm. If we are, we are not seen to be having a level playing field, after 4 November, it's going to be very difficult to unite the party mm. against the NDC. And for me, that is my worry. Because if people feel that they have, been, they have, not, they have not been fairly treated, mm. how do you expect them to cooperate with, with, with the party after the contest when they feel that they haven't been treated well? For eight years between 2009 and 2016, Dr. Fi Yakoto served as a member of parliament for Kwadaso in the Ashanti region. He was made food and agriculture minister when the MPP won power in 2016. During his six year tenure, he spearheaded a government flagship program planning for food and jobs. The son of the late Ashanti linguist Bafu Akoto is counting on his strong roots in the Ashanti region to prepare him to victory. But he faces challenges there because the regional chairman, Bernard Nkibu Yakum, also known as Chairman Wuntumim, has thrown his weight behind the vice president, Dr. Mamadou Baumia. The delegates down there have no respect for the conduct of the regional chairman. And his impression that he creates that he is in charge of the, of the delegates will be proven on the 4th of November. Whether the kind of percentage that the, his candidate got will be repeated down there is still something that we have to wait for. Mm. But I'm confident that the, the message I've given to the people of Ashanti and to the rest of this country, the delegates know that this is the man. Dr. Fiyakoto is hoping victory this weekend will help him reform the party and make it battle ready to win the upcoming 2024 general elections. This, he noted, will also enable him to have the mandate to pursue sustainable policies that are aimed at renewing the hope and confidence of the MPP fraternity. 
we want to bring fundamental reforms into the MPP. We are not in a good place, and I'm the first to admit, and also the way the party is managed. We have a reg rules and regulations which say that if you are a party official, you don't define or come out to say that you are supporting this person or that person. Mm. And look at what is happening. The whole government, the whole parliament, the whole party, most of the party, people, uh, managers and so on, have come out openly to say that they support one person. And it goes against the rules. So that I, I alone should tell you that there's something wrong with our party. And for me, I'm very unhappy. For those who have worked closely with him, he is the best man for the job. Peter Otendako is a close confidant. Um, I would describe Dr. Kutu as a go-getter, somebody whose words are sacred. If Dr. Kutu says this, take it as a contract. He means every word that he says. Mm. And Dr. Kutu is a very serious person. He's somebody who is an authority. If he says, let's deliver this, he will ensure that you deliver to the latter. Mm. That is Dr. Kutu. Elton Brobe for Joy News. Another contender, uh, uh, engineer Adai Nemo, has also been speaking about campaign finance and explaining some aspirants are more equipped than the others, adding there must be a way to ensure a level playing field. He spoke on PM Express. Understand what difference would that make? It will. Assuming we have to go on a constituency tour, and there are five contestants, everybody should contribute. It's going to cost us, let's say, Mm. 1,000 Ghana cities. Put it in the pool. Put it in the pool. Everybody contributes. Then the party takes that money. The party has to organize that platform for all of you, the contestants. So you are going there to deliver your message to the, to the delegates. You don't pay anything. It's now for the party structure to remit delegates who showed up by way of their TNT from their various communities to the central point mm. of meeting. What have, so you, you, you yeah. see that, that is... What, what have you seen in this campaign from your other contestants? Well, they may be more resourceful because the three of them we are remaining for, the three of them have all been part of the current MPP government under Nana Akufu with the exception of Ada anymore, as you are aware. Yeah, but Kennedy Dupont has been a member of parliament only. No, he's also part of the government as a board chairman for Ghana Gas. Well, yeah, I mean, but that is, you know, on the periphery. Re really? Really? A state institution like Ghana Gas, where they disperse millions of Ghana cities, and as board chairman, you supervise the disbursement of millions of Ghana cities, and that could even matter to the whole budget of a ministry. Are you saying he's a beneficiary of that distribution? I don't know, no. I haven't said so. But you supervise. So yeah, you cannot... Supervising doesn't give no. you the resource directly. Then. It doesn't, I know. No, no, you are not just a board chair. Board chair policies will emanate from the board for implementation by management. And as board chair, you cannot absorb yourself from the policies that will come from them. I get it, but I don't see how that translates into him being more wealthy in the campaign. Well, I mean, it depends how you look at it. How do you look at it? There can be an inherent, I mean, benefit. As a board chairman, there can be an inherent benefit. And so that's why you can't run away from it. Another interest may also arise. I may not have evidence to show. But Meanwhile, a group of MPP delegates outside Ghana have declared their support for Dr. Mamadou Balmi ahead of the party's November 4 presidential uh, primaries. The delegates who have traveled back to Ghana to participate in the electoral process say the vice president represents their choice of candidate to lead the party in breaking the eight. At a press conference held in Kumase, the group pleaded with the over 200,000 delegates nationwide to vote for the vice president on Saturday, November 4. As the governing new patriotic party goes to the polls to elect a flag bearer on November 4th, some delegates across the country and abroad have declared their support for Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. 
The group calling itself Diaspora for Baumia says it believes in the vision of the Vice President with confidence to lead the MPP into a historic victory on December 7, 2024. Dr. Mamad Baumia on his campaign journey has shown competence, tolerance and experience. He has shown that he is the one to unite the party. The leadership have made a statement and all of us, we back all the leadership. Grassroots are solidly behind Dr. Mohamed Baumia, who stands for unity. And we believe that when he wins, MPP, we are all coming together as one party with one body, and we are going to win come November 4th. Chairman of the group, Kinsley Ahenkwa Dudu, says the endorsement for Dr. Baumia is based on his contribution to the party. We have seen the global economic hardship in all global, in US, UK, and all the external branches. We are in here to speak to that and also to assure Ghanaians that the NPP government is the only government to bring back our economy. And we can do this by voting massively for Dr. Mohamed Baumia come November 4th. We are here to appeal to all delegates, both home and abroad, to vote massively. For Dr. Dr. Mohamed Bohomia, we want to make a statement. We are looking at 90% now. We want to make an acclamation for Dr. Mohamed Bohomia. Mr. Judo believes Dr. Bohomia can help the party win the crucial 2024 general elections. We are in to support Dr. Mohamed Bohomia because we believe that Dr. Mohamed Bohomia is the only person to change the economic challenges that we are currently facing. And NPP, grassroots, both home and abroad, we are all solidly behind him. We want to make a statement, and we will all rally behind him come 2024 general election. We are about to make another statement. This, I, we, we, we see this to be an acclamation. We are united with one voice, and we are going in for Dr. Mahmoud Bohemia. In fact, this is not a situation of peer delegates. The grassroots, we are solidly behind him, and we are winning massively come November 4th. For Joe News, Nana Bwachi Dankwe Yadom, Kumasi. Let's now cross over to the Holy Spirit Cathedral, where the board of the National Cathedral is updating the public on the project. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Justice Sophia Krofi, uh, who was uh, retired Archbishop, uh, but also was uh, the head of the West African uh, Division of the Anglican uh, Communion in West Africa. Uh, so these are the, uh, and then I am Paul Pokumens and Executive Director. We have some of our uh, staff. We have the Director of Administration and Finance, uh, Pastor Daku Nicholas Daku, uh, who used to be the Head of Finance and Admin at the Church of Pentecost. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Gil, who is our accountant, uh, Chief mm -hmm. Accountant. We have Reverend Thomas Amiao, uh, Church uh, Relations. Uh, we have the Director of Operations, Ninette uh, Boachin. So, once again, thank you very much for coming. Others are not uh, here. Uh, mm -hmm. So those who come will introduce them as they come in. So, uh. All right. Um, I've just returned from the city of Vatican. Um, I, I was nominated by the Pentecostal World Fellowship to represent the fellowship at the 16th Ordinary General Assembly of the Synods of bishops of the Catholic Church. And um, it was a one-month synodal experience. So you spent roughly one month there. And I liked the methodology. It was a sort of roundtable uh, um, method that was used. Twelve people on a table. And then um, before any model, the authorities would like about two theologians to present papers, then three practitioners also to give some sort of testimonies. Then after that, the tables will begin to work. 
Now, on the table, one is the facilitator selected by the leadership to facilitate the table uh, conference. And then um, a secretary also will be chosen or given to the table. But then the table is given the freedom to appoint their own repertoire, who in a way be, became the leader of the group. Now, a document had already been collected from local level, parishes to diocese, from diocese to national level to regional level like West Africa, and then to continental. Then after the continental, all the documents were compiled into a book. Then out of that book, a working document was prepared. From the working uh, document, a model will be expected to be treated to be treated within five days. Now, you have to read the document and then make your presentation within three minutes. So each one of us was to speak. Now, you cannot speak more than four minutes. So that did not give the extroverts the opportunity of overshadowing the introverts. Because I've observed that in meetings, extroverts often <laughs> impose themselves. And if even the extrovert has sp spoken for about one hour, 30 minutes, and you want him to stop, he thinks, he or she thinks that you have not given him enough opp opportunity to speak. But here, equal time was given to everybody. And then you were obliged to present yours, then another person to present his or hers. Then after that, you were to tell us what you heard from your neighbor. And then after telling what you heard from your neighbor for not more than three minutes, then each one of us two was to speak about what you think is the consensus. What have we agreed? What converged? And then the tension or matters of concern or those that we couldn't agree. So you were not to fight with one another, mm -hmm. but then to find out your point of convergences and other areas that you do not agree. And I thought it was very humbling on us and, very, and a sign of humility on the point of the Catholic Church to be able to invite fraternal delegates to sit in their meetings and pour their hearts, both their weaknesses and strength, in the presence of Protestants. Some people who were supposed to have protested against what you are doing. But having the humility of bringing them on table and listening to them, I think it's a practice that we need to learn. I've come to realize that in, within countries and societies, institutions and churches, sometimes if you are not careful, people who are supposed to love one another begin to fight one another. And when we fight one another, we don't succeed. So in a country like Ghana, roughly 32 million people, if we don't have the ability of listening to one another, hearing from one another, allowing one another to speak for us to find our point of convergences and then matters of concern and deal with them, we keep on devouring one another. And if you do that, you cannot develop. And therefore, when the director sent me a copy of your letter and told me that you want an update of the National Cathedral, I thought it was very prudent and appropriate because you want to hear from us what is going on. We've heard many things going on. What is happening? Can we come and listen to it? Thank you very much. And because of your request, I will allow the direct director to give us an update of the project so that after that you can also ask any questions that you want to ask. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so an extrovert, we don't expect him to take too much advantage and speak over one and a half hours. No. <laughs> Good morning uh, once again. And uh, I think, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. I think he's really uh, set uh, the stage uh, for the tone uh, of this uh, update. Uh, this really is not about fighting, uh, it's not a shouting battle, 
is really about an update on what we believe is a critical national project. Um, and, and once again, I also want to reiterate uh, his appreciation, the chairman's appreciation, uh, to our political parties uh, outside uh, parliament. Uh, in a sense, I thought this was initially when I, I got the letter, I thought this was long overdue. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I also felt this was perfect timing. Um, because last week, I remember I had the notion of a Kairos moment uh, twice applied to the National Cathedral Project. Uh, the, the concept of a Kairos moment is almost biblical, but it really speaks to perfect timing. Uh, and, and from the biblical perspective, it really talks about uh, this notion of in the fullness of time. Uh, so from our end, although at one level, uh, you are the last ones coming to ask for this, we believe the timing is perfect and it comes at a time when it is actually needed very uh, most. And as you know, as a country, we've had four democratic experiments, or republics, as we call them in our country, since independence in 1957. Uh, the current experiment, the Fourth Republic, which started in January 1993, has lasted the longest. And because of this, it has allowed us uh, to witness firsthand some of the challenges of this stability in our democratic journey. And one of the key challenges has to do with the structure of our politics around two axes, or political parties. On the one hand, this structure, along two relatively stable political parties, have augured well for continuity, consolidation, and political accountability, as we have been able to create what democratic theorists refer to as substantive uncertainty. In fact, Ghana is one of the few countries that has been able to achieve that, where at any given election, there can be a change uh, and a stable change in government. On the other hand, having only two political parties locked in this winner-takes-all frame almost prevents a rational debate on anything, as there is a constant urge to bastardize, trivialize, and sensationalize issues. And this is not just Ghana. Anywhere you have, look at what is happening in the U.S. Anywhere you have only two political parties, this is what you, you get. In this political contest, where the two major political parties in parliament are engaged in an almost zero-sum existential battle for supremacy and dominance, the political parties outside parliament could actually provide the sanitizing, mediating influence that we so badly and urgently need in our politics. So first, as a Ghanaian, I want to thank you for remaining active and relevant, even though at the moment you have no representation in parliament. Uh, given the winner-takes-all structure of our politics, I can only imagine that it's a tough existence for the political parties outside parliament. But we thank you for uh, the consistency with which you've remained active and relevant in our politics. We need that mediating influence that you provide. I spent almost uh, two decades of my professional life in Norway and Denmark, whereby the structure of their politics, you cannot form a government without going into coalition for other parties. So that makes their politics a bit more civil and certainly a far cry from the bickering that characterizes our national conversations. The national conversation on the National Cathedral has suffered this fate of being buffeted along the two axes with the objective of sensationalizing and bastardizing the project for political goals. So first, as a Ghanaian who was to see some sanity in our politics and a more rational national conversation on the National Cathedral, we welcome this opportunity to meet with the leadership of the PPOP. I hope that this is just the beginning of a set of conversations that will lead to a more rational understanding of the National Cathedral Project. We also welcome your framing of seek in developmental terms. Uh, I was very happy to read the letter uh, it was really not uh, accused, and he just wanted to understand the developmental impact of this project. Uh, so we thank you for that framing, which almost moves it away from the adversarial conversations and framing uh, that has characterized discussions on the national project. This is how we have developed the National Cathedral Project, and then, but this has somehow been lost uh, in the adversarial, raucous, politicized debate. In other words, we believe that the political parties outside parliament could be the vehicle that begins to rationally express and aggregate the diverse potentials of the National Cathedral to our citizens, 
at this stage, I was actually going to <laughs> show an image. Mm. I think we, we, we lost, we kind of didn't understand the setup. Uh, what we have done, though, is that we have a USB yeah. with... So we will give all of you, uh, in fact, it's, it's, uh, we'll give all of you uh, the images we're going to show. It was the images about the National Cathedral, the element. Uh, I'll be doing my best to explain, uh, but as we have said, all of you will receive USB uh, cards with all these images. And as I said, we are hoping that this is just the beginning of a set of conversations. So we'll be providing you with additional information as we uh, go along in this uh, conversations. So once again, thank you. So understanding, so let me begin with my uh, update. The then they would have to I think, I think we have to do without it. Oh, no, I well, that, that would be good, yeah. I see. Yeah. You and then I can. Then I can. Yes. Okay. So we can use the. We can go through the images. Yeah. Yes. So you have to. No. Yeah. So yeah. We can go through the images quickly. Yes. 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 Okay, so we can do that. So please let's go on. Oh, the, covering it like yes. Okay, please let's go on. Uh, so uh, this session is understanding the National Cathedral. Uh, of course, and he says show the image of the elements of the vision which we can. Uh, th this was what we we're going to show. I asked them to put copies on all of the tables. Uh, Eugene, the understanding the National Cathedral. I asked that it be put. So at least you understand the elements we're going to talk about. Uh, right, so show, show it around. My task then is really, as I indicated, uh, very simple, and to provide an update on the National Criteria Project, where it stands now. Uh, but given that this is the first time we are meeting with the political parties outside Parliament, uh, I want to start from the beginning and work my way from there. Uh, the presentation will therefore be structured around the following set of issues. One, uh, the vision of the president and the leadership that is the board set up to manage and oversee the vision. Two, implementation, in particular the developmental rationale and vision of the framework for implementing the project. Three, status of the design and conceptual work. Four, the status of the construction. Five, accountability and fundraising. And then six, the future of the National Cathedral Project. These are the issues around which I'll be framing uh, my update. Uh, these are the issues that we believe are key to understanding the National Cathedral Project, uh, where we are in the project and what will be needed to complete it. So what is the National Cathedral Project? To recap, on March 6, 2017, the 60th anniversary of our country's independence, the president in his first Independence Day address made a surprise historic announcement, and I quote, I'm happy to announce that on my way to these grounds, that is the Independence Square, I stopped to perform a very important duty. I have this morning cut the sword for the commencement of the building of a national cathedral of interdenominational worship in our capital, Accra, which is supported by many of our leading figures of faith. It is meant to be a gesture of thanksgiving to the Almighty for the blessings he showered and continues to shower on our nation, unquote. This was the first official announcement that kicked off the implementation of the project. That is the National Cathedral of Ghana. It was, as I indicated, part of the CCF legacy project from our CCF anniversary celebrations and was supposed to provide a missing link in the nation's architecture by providing a formal space for the religious activities of the state. The National Cathedral provides, therefore, an interdenominational space for worship and will serve to insert God at the center of our nation building efforts. It will serve as a fulcrum for unifying the Christian community and serve as a tribute to religious liberty in the country. But more importantly, it will also serve as the nation's collective thanksgiving to the Almighty for the blessings he's bestowed on the country. I would have shown kind of the web address, uh, the WW National Cathedral, Ghana, where all this history 
uh, can be found. So www.nationalcathedralghana.org. All the history, all these elements also can also be found. The essence of the National Cathedral of Ghana is aptly captured by the Catholic Archbishop Emeritus of the Kumasi Archdiocese, Most Reverend Dr. Kwasi Sapon, who argues that, and I quote, a national cathedral unifies and invites the whole nation as one family of God. In the National Cathedral, the bishop is God himself, stretching his fatherly hand over the nation and its inhabitants and guests. Unquote. Implementation rational. A week after the formal announcement and sword cutting, that is on January 13, 2023, 2017, sorry, the president inaugurated a board of trustees made up of leading clergy in the country to oversee the project. An executive director to manage the secretary was also appointed in November 2017. So since this official announcement on March 6, 2017, and an appointment uh, or the inauguration of the board, at the time the board of trustees and the secretariat, significant progress has been made to the level where all the foundational work has been completed. Although the National Cathedral was envisaged as a sacred infrastructure for Ghana, we have integrated elements to make it relevant to the developmental aspirations of the country and also made it relevant to the African and global church. First, the design. Described as an architectural expression of Christianity, captures the moment when Christianity has become a significant force on Africa's institutional landscape and is the continent with the largest number of Christians. <coughs> the design is a path-breaking work of iconic Ghanaian-British architect, Sir David Ajay, who designed the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. His current major work, the Abrahamic Family House in the United Arab Emirates, was opened in February 2023. Building on this design, the National Cathedral has been developed as a home for African Christianity and has an auditorium space of 5,000 expandable to 15,000 on key national events. It has chapels, prayer rooms, and provides the missing infrastructure for the solemn national occasions like state funerals, presidential inaugural services, national Thanksgiving services, and others. As an infrastructure, it also provides a platform for Christian unity for over the 70% of Ghana's population who are Christians thereby fostering national cohesion, as the Supreme Court of Ghana argued in its 23rd January 2019 seminal ruling on the project. The National Cathedral, as a symbolic architectural expression and celebration of the historically unparalleled growth of Christianity on the African continent, responds to a major concern with the lack of acknowledgement of this dramatic growth of Christianity on the African continent. As a recent 2022 book on African Christianity titled Africa to the Rest argues, and I quote, Africa is the most Christian continent in the world today. In the year 2018, for the first time in history, there were more Christians in Africa than in any other continent in the entire world. The continent now has well over 670 million Christ followers. It gets even more impressive. By 2050, there will, there will likely be more Christians in Africa, that is 1.25 billion, than in the current second and third place contenders, Latin America, 705 million, and Europe, 490 million, respectively combined. Yet, since the publishing of this joyous fact, we have traversed nearly every continent, including several countries within Africa itself, and have not found this momentous occasion in world history acknowledged much let alone profusely celebrated to our satisfaction, unquote. The National Cathedral of Ghana offers the much-deserved architectural celebration of this historic breakthrough in Africa. But it does more than just celebrate this shift in the center of gravity of Christianity to the African continent. In addition, and perhaps more important, it seeks to create an African Christian metropolis to institutionalize this epochal event. The notion of an African Christian metropolis was first introduced by one of the intellectual fathers of our country, Dr. J.B. Dankwa, and speaks to the issue of Christian permanence on the African continent. In other words, the National Cathedral Project not only celebrates this historic event, but in addition, it provides the infrastructure, including the research, to promote Christian permanence on the continent and turn Ghana into an important religious site for religious pilgrimage and international tourism. 
Uh, and I was going to show an example of how religious tourism is now becoming a critical and important factor in national transformation, using the example of the Zayed uh, Grand Mosque in Abu Dhabi, uh, which was opened in 2007. Before that, uh, Abu Dhabi was not known for any religious tourism. It's really Mecca. And now, uh, following the completion of that infrastructure, which cost about $655 million, uh, Abu Dhabi, or the Grand Mosque, has become the second most visited religious site in the Middle East after Mecca. Uh, last year, it had 6 million uh, visitors. In other words, the, the issue of religion and pilgrimage religious infrastructure has become such a key part in countries' uh, strategies to attract tourists. And that's what we plan to do with the National Cathedral of uh, Ghana. And this is particularly promoted, this uh, strategy to turn Ghana into a religious hub is particularly promoted by the second key initiative we've integrated into the project, dubbed the Bible Museum of Africa. Covering over 150,000 square feet of exhibition space and whose development is coordinated by the founding president of the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., it will be the largest Bible museum in the world with a thematic focus on one, the role of Africa and Africans in the Bible, and two, the history and contemporary place of the church in Africa and the African diaspora. Among others, it will host, house all Bibles translated into African languages, tell the story of the church in Africa and the African diaspora, and provide a convenient platform for occasions or discussions on the role of faith in Africa's transformation. Once again, I was going to show at the webpage, uh, www.biblemuseumafrica.org, where you see the concept and all the development. Uh, everything is developed. It's really, uh, we are at a stage where we can just uh, bring in once the building is ready. Uh, it is once again www.biblemuseumafrica.org. All these things are there, the concept, the design, and where it is. We wanted to make sure that uh, Ghanaians understand where this project is. It's not just at the level of conversations. It's not just at the level of ideas and concepts. It's really the designs are already 100% completed. Third, the project has integrated the biblical gardens of Africa. Covering a space of about 10,000 square feet, it will include the trees, shrubs, and flowers of the Bible and serve as a major resource for Christians all over the African continent. Once again, www.biblemuseumafrica.org includes the, Bible, the biblical gardens of Africa. All the, uh, the concepts, the images, the concept development, everything is there. Uh, everything is available to the public. The development of the Bible Museum of Africa and the Biblical Gardens of Africa is undertaken by a world-class team of firms, including one, the Himaya Group, two, the PRD Group, group three, Cubic Multibee, four, Cortina Productions, five, Jonathan Martin Creative Incorporated. The project portfolios of these companies include key international landmarks, such as National Museum of African American History and Culture, the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., the Creation Museum, the Ark Encounter, the Nazareth First Century Village in Nazareth, Israel, the 9-11 Pentagon Memorial uh, Center, Perro Museum of Natural Nature and Science, George W. Bush, Presidential Library and Museum, Royal Alberta Museum in Edmonton, Canada, the Mohammed Ali Center, the Empire State Building Project, International Spy Museum, the Statue of Liberty Museum, Art Gallery of uh, Ontario, the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, Winnipeg, and others. In other words, and then the Museum of World Religions in Taiwan. Uh, once again, we wanted to show that what we have done is really to say that if we're going to spend this kind of money, this should be done at a level where we attract the world. And that means really going for those uh, who are the leading edge of these things, who have developed the leading museums in the world. Those are, these are the teams we've assembled. Uh, they've been here. They've done all the work. You go to, once again, www.biblemuseumafrica.org. You see their portfolios. You see all the work they have done. Fourth, the cathedral and museum would also serve as a convenient platform for national, African, and global conversations on the role of faith and national transformation. The most recent conversation, in other words, we've actually begun this convening uh, platform of the National Cathedral. The most recent conversation was a Pan-African Symposium held on September 14, 2023, barely a month ago, at the University of Ghana titled, Is Christianity the White Man's Religion, the Bible and the Making and Remaking of the African Diaspora? This was organized 
in partnership with the Urban Renewal Center in Virginia, USA, and the Alliance of Black Pentecostal Scholarship. The aim is to develop this into a Pan-African platform on the Bible and the African diaspora. The partnership is currently planning to develop a proposal for a three to five year symposium series to be titled The Bible and the African Diaspora. The aim is to provide a platform for linking Africa and the diaspora